Welcome to Beat the Markets. I'm Ritger. And I'm BKM. So Ritger, for a long time, investment was seemed to be done with good old fashioned stock picking or timing the markets. And over the course of maybe the last 30, 40 years, academics and uh, I guess people that study these things have sort of said, well, that's not so easy to do. It's not that easy to beat the markets through timing and security selection. But they have come up with this area where they think you can beat the markets. And it's the in thing in investing right now, and they call it smart beta. So what is smart beta? What is factor investing? Factor investing, smart beta, they mean the same thing. It's uh how academics have come to terms with the fact that some people have been able to consistently beat the markets over the long term. This goes back to uh, a classic debate between Warren Buffett and the uh, academics in the 1970s, 1980s, um, who were proponents of the efficient market theory, which said that stocks just move randomly, that uh, the investors who happen to have a higher return than the average are just the, uh, the, the the lucky dart throwers. If you take the Wall Street Journal printout of stocks and put it on a dartboard, chuck darts at it, buy those stocks, that uh, you're always going to have a few managers. You're always going to have you know your your lucky guys at the top. After ten years, there'll be some guys who are better than other guys. But uh, so Buffett wrote an essay. In, I think it was in the mid '80s. It was called "The uh, Super Investors of Graham and Doddsville." He said, this was him refuting, refuting the academics by saying, if all, these, if all these investors, these lucky dart throwers, happen to have gone to the same dart throwing school, maybe there's something going on there. And he pointed out, he, he highlighted um, his, uh, a lot of his buddies who had come from the same school of value investing. Now, Buffett's story is he, um, he found a copy of, of uh, Graham and Dodd's book, The Intelligent Investor, in or sec security analysis, and then The Intelligent Investor in the 50s when he was a young man, um, uh, I guess when he was in college, and then he went to, um, to the Columbia Business School just to study under Ben Graham, who was a, a hedge fund manager, but who also was a professor there and then convinced him to give him a job in his fund. But um, <clears throat> Buffett proved that if, if you just screened for stocks that were cheap, and then later when he met Munger, he started applying a quality screen, and, <laughs> and um, were strict about that, didn't chase, you know, didn't chase hot stocks, just kept it simple, kept it kind of boring, that you would trounce the market. I mean, he outperformed the market by 10%, I think, for which ended up being 20% you know, odd returns for the first bit of his career. Um, so that was the mid 80s, and then not long after that, you had a you had a, a groundbreaking paper. I'm going to be fuzzy on these dates, but I think it was 1992 when Eugene Fama came out with yeah. his his updated version of the efficient market hypothesis. So the, a few academics did listen to Buffett. They did see that something was happening there. And, and then they validated his, uh, his methodology. They said, wow, it's true. You can actually identify cheap stocks. And if you just buy cheap stocks, you'll do better than the average. What do you know? So they called that the, uh, the first, the first um, factor model of the efficient market hypothesis was just value and quality, I think. No, size. It was size. Three factors. That's right. It was three factors, value, quality, and size. So small cap stocks outperform big cap stocks. Um, value stocks are those stocks trading at low multiples of book value, of sales, of earnings. Cheap stocks. And then quality um, was an extra filter you would apply on top of value stocks to make sure that you're not buying cheap, you're not buying stocks that are cheap only because they're crappy. because. Stocks that are going to go out of business look <laughs> cheap before they're delisted. Right. So uh, yeah, that was that was the early '90s, and then since then we've um, we've seen a couple other factors get added on. Well, well, according to these guys that are coming out with factors, it's become a factor 
zoo or there's a lot of factors. Um, at least five. But, but I think uh, the academics that were incorporating the factors in the study, I don't exactly know how they, how they do their studies, but the, but the, the first factor or, or the risk, risk return um, trade-off only accounted for 75% of the returns. That's right. So when they included value and, and size, that incorporated for 90% of the returns. Mm -hmm. And I think, and then when they added in momentum, that accounted for 95% of all the excess returns. So if you, if you have those, and, the, and then the other big one, the other big one is uh, quality and uh, Profitability, or or call it, uh, what, what do we call that? What do we want to call that factor? Well, they're they're different. It's basically they're different. There's the new Q factor model. If you come across no, this, no, <laughs> what's the Q a factor? A paper came out a few years ago. It was a they it was, it's a four factor model that seems to do um, at least as good a job as the Fama and French five factor model. But they're all okay. basically looking at the same thing. You got small cap, you got value, you got quality, and you got momentum. Okay, so let's discuss th that. Um, let, let's let's narrow that. Let, let's put that into just like one sentence. So I guess what they're saying is, if you take these three factors, size, meaning small caps have a tendency to outperform large caps. That's right. Over time. That's right. You take value, which is that cheap stocks have a tendency to give you outperformance over time over expensive stocks, mm -hmm. and momentum. Stocks that are doing well tend to keep doing well over time. If you take those three factors, and quality, fact and quality, quality. so quali some companies that have, and how do they determine quality? They don't have too much debt, and they have a steady, they have steady revenues, um, steady earnings, and uh, profitability. Profitability is sometimes called a factor, and sometimes called uh, like profit margins. Profit Higher mar profit okay. margins are better. Y yeah, that's sometimes called a factor. Sometimes it's thrown in with quality. On a side note to that, when I did do stock picking, Rick, that to me was the was the most important thing uh, was was profit margin because if you take revenue minus cost of goods sold and there, uh, minus cost of goods sold, and that number is high, that to me means you're doing something special because otherwise it's just a commodity business. That's one of the reasons why I don't like a lot of um, a lot of you know businesses in developing countries is that they. I don't want to paint everything with the same brush, but their margins tend to be very, very thin. And if you look at all the great American corporations, manufacturing, yeah, manufacturers have very thin profit margins, and which to me is an indicator that you're not doing anything really special. It's, you're, you're not generating a lot of in the corporate world a, alpha yeah. on, on top. You just you know, so but um, but if you look at all the great American corporations, Coca-Cola, Johnson and Johnson. Um, and they turn out to be brands, but they have a tr they, there's something special in that profit margin. They, they all have 30, 40, 50 percent profit. Microsoft, mm -hmm. they have 30, 40, 50 percent profit margin. They're doing some magic between their cost of goods sold and their, yeah, and their revenue. That's right. Yeah, Buffett and Munger were talking about this in the 70s. They called it the margin of safety. It is. It's a cushion. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, the, yeah there's a few ways. To, yeah, that, that's, that's the margin, the moat. The economic Party. mode of a business. That's, yeah. But um, so going, getting back to getting back to the the factors is is the the idea is that if you put together these these traits of uh, uh, value, uh, momentum, size, mm -hmm. and profitability or slash quality, um, you'll have you'll you'll outperform the markets over time, and that's been an academically proven way to beat the markets. Absolutely, this is no longer controversial. And there's no, there's no secret sauce either. This is all defined now. You can do this completely automatically. And funds that do this, good, honest funds that do this, don't charge very much for it anymore. You're talking half a percent, thereabouts, um, well under 1%, to get uh, significant outperformance. Now, the, your, uh, your premium for these factors over the S&P, or the you know, pick your index, but your your out your your uh, historical outperformance or your future expected outperformance for these factors is on the order of a few percent. Let me just I took some notes here. So over uh, these are not adjusted for inflation. So 1927 to 2013, your your beta of the stock market. This a beta is a they call it a factor. The equity risk premium. It's 
it's not a, it's like your, your baseline factor. Um, how much more over the long term do you get for being in stocks as opposed to um, near term treasury bills? Your, uh, Suppose your a risk free rate. That's right. So, you, how much you compensated for the volatility of the stock market? And that's a key point. You're, all, of these, all of these factors come out of cost. There's a reason why they're persistent. You're getting paid to do something. Usually accept more volatility, accept some kind of risk. But over, when you average it all out among a bunch of stocks and over the long term, it, uh, it, you, come out, you come out ahead. So anyway, the equity risk premium over T-bills over the long term has been about 8%. And then on top of that, you've been able to get another 3% for small cap stocks. And they say that that one's come, that one's come down a bit in recent years, although you can still get a nice, um, a nice small cap premium overseas. All of these have compressed a bit in recent years. Have, have they compressed because the secret is out? The secret's out. And, and You've got a lot more smart managers now. A lot more, a lot more money chasing this, chasing this. They, they've yeah, identified that. that so, so what happens? What, what's happens in the investment world is that the, the the academic study comes out that says small caps give you a premium. So there's a lot of people that it's more like a lot of smart managers figure it out, and then the academics eventually get the idea and prove it, and then a lot of managers, and then everybody piles in, and and that causes a little bit of compression on t in the and the excess. It's all return. driven by the practitioners. This is actually something that Nassim Taleb gets back to. I mean, he, he, he hates academics, calls them intellectuals, yet idiots. <laughs> <laughs> they don't drive innovation. Academics do not figure out anything on their own. They just, they hear something or maybe, maybe once in a while you get a guy like Cliff Asness who ends up being a practitioner, but he goes through the academic system first and he makes a contribution along the way. Like, uh, but um, he talks about how this, you know, options traders, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, had pretty sophisticated pricing models which were actually better and more useful than the Black-Scholes model, which wasn't invented until, what, the 70s? Right. Well, even in, in contemporary time, Ed Thorpe yeah, was, absolutely. was really trading options and generating huge as, alpha, hu huge alpha yeah. um, and implementing what became, or Black-Scholes-like, uh, implementing 10 years before Black-Scholes ever came about. That's right. That's right. So academics always say you can't do it. it we know everything. It's all it's all efficient and logical, and um, you know the markets operate according to the, this math right here. And the practitioners are out there seeing how it really works and figuring out how to how you know how to consistently um, generate alpha. Well, that's a great point. Let's 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 spend a little bit of time on that. Is that is this idea that the practitioners are really implementing? Real world strategies and and gener and figuring out what works. Yeah, they got skin in the game. And the academics come along and say, well, something doesn't work and some things don't work or you can't do. So, w w at what level do we, w where do we say the academics are right and we and we and we use what they say and where do we say that they're that they don't know what they're talking about? The academics get better and better over time. <laughs> uh, and you know, once something is defined by the academics, then you can get it cheaply. You don't have to pay very much for it. You can get it reliably. Um, you don't have to go out on a wing and say, you know, I've got this manager who's figured out the secret sauce. Because there are a lot of, there are a lot of recipes you can just look up and use. They're free. So, you know, there are cheap recipes out there that, that work consistently. And they're good enough, so why not go with them? I think that's the way I think about it. Okay, so so, I mean, boiling it down, we we we're in the camp that says that these three factors are, are good factors, and and the five factors, the, the five the five factors. So I mean, the fifth the, the fifth being the first one being cap, uh, just the equity premium. Let's let's go through them. I'll just go through them real quick. So you got your equity risk premium about eight percent. Small cap over large cap. Small caps will outperform large caps by about three percent. Um, your value premium, about 5%, that's cheap stocks. Um, your moment, your uh, quality premium on top of that is going to add another, another couple percent. And then your momentum premium, your stocks that have performed well over the, um, the last 6 to 12 months tend to outperform those that have done poorly over the last 6 to 12 months. Um, 
that's something that it, that's that the quality of momentum exists for the market as a whole and for most asset classes except for bonds. Um, so those that, yeah, those are your fat. Oh, and that's a that's a big one. That's over eight percent. The momentum factor. So those are your factors. Um, there are funds out there now that will give you the, those factors or combinations of them for um, for very cheap, and they will beat over the long term. They will beat the S and P. Uh, let me let me harp on the S and P for a moment. Because a lot of people get stuck on this. They think the S&P is the market, and it's pointless to try to beat the S&P. But the S&P is just, it's a mathematical construct that was not designed to be an investment vehicle. Just, it's just like the Dow. The Dow is calculated as the average of the stock prices of these 30 big companies. It's weighted according to their prices. That's, I guess this is because when it was invented in the 1800s, you, you didn't know how many shares of uh, you know, U.S. Steel or, or uh, uh, Standard Oil were outstanding. You could have issued or bought back some shares. So you just looked at the prices and you took an average of the prices as quoted every day. Um, it's a really wacky way to do it because the price is essentially random. You know, Amazon's price is like 900 bucks, and uh, you know, Apple's. You know, Google. Google's done splits, right? I, I don't even know what these stock, but, but, you know, two companies can have equivalent market caps, and one can have a share price that's ten times the other. In the Dow, one's weighted ten times as much as the other. It makes yeah. no sense. Well, I think when he started it, he just—I he, mean, he was—he was Charles. That was like a reporter, and yeah. and he was trying to report about the markets, and it seemed good at the time. Who he? I mean, who knew what was going to end up becoming, and this index was going to be the way to measure. The crazy thing is, though. Because you got 30 stocks in there, it all kind of averages out. <laughs> so if you look at the Dow and the S&P, which is a better constructed index, sure, it's got 500 companies, not just 30, and it's weighted according to market cap, not just share price. They, you know, over those 30 stocks, it averages out. So it's it's pretty good. It works. It works. Well, believe it or not, it works. You, know, yeah. it, you put the law of large numbers on your side, and crude things will work. Um, so the, yeah, the S&P was invented in the 50s and retroactively calculated back to the 1800s. So we can look at things like the, you know, the Schiller PE back to the 20s and see what it was. But um, it, was, it was invented in the 50s to be, uh, you know, to be a, a better index, to just see how the market's doing. And nobody even thought of an index fund until, um, until John Bogle, he did his, his uh, senior thesis at Princeton about how most mutual fund managers don't earn their fees. They underperform, they underperform the Dow or the market as a whole. And, and who, uh, who is the other? Oh, I forget. He, he, there was another academic who did, some, who did some supporting work in the 50s and 60s. And then um, in the 70s, Bogle founded Vanguard and launched the first index fund, an S&P 500 index fund, which is still around Vanguard's. Vanguard's flagship fund, um, which was just giving investors the return of the S&P 500 for low fees. They guaranteed them the S&P, which was good enough, which was better, it turned out, than the average fund manager. And with the average fund manager would underperform by just a little bit, but then he'd charge quite a bit. So you reduce that fee by a lot, and you give, you give the investor the market and over the long run, you're going to be in the top tier of funds just by giving people the average. But the S&P was not designed to be an efficient investment vehicle. Its biggest flaw is market cap weighting. Uh, the, the bigger a company is, the higher it's weighting in, in the index. It's, I guess it's fine for seeing how the market's doing. And the health of the overall economy. It, yeah, it reflects you know, the overall valuation of the stock market, but it's not a good investment formula because the bigger a company is, the harder it is to grow. It's just, I mean, it's just uh, obvious. Yeah, trees don't grow to the sky. Yeah, it's, you can grow a lot faster when you're small than when you're big. So if you just take that same 500, those same 500 companies and equally weight them when you're allocating your capital, you end up vastly outperforming the S&P. I mean, over the last 10 years, an equal weighted fund is outperformed by like 50%. Is that, is that alpha? 
No, not really. Because when you're doing something that simple and formulaic, I mean, heck, screening these, to get back to the factors, the factors, getting these excess returns through factor investing, screening for value, screening for quality, doing your momentum, your momentum system. This, this is not considered alpha anymore. Well, that's why they came up with smart beta. It's, they call it smart beta. You're not, you know, you're beating the S&P by a few percent a year by doing this stuff. You're nothing special. You're not, it seems great. Most investors are underperforming. Most individuals are underperforming the S&P by a few percent a year. You shouldn't even be trying. But um, investors who do this, who, who employ um, factor systems, should not be professional investors who do this. Should not be considered, uh, you know, geniuses. Buffett doing this in the '50s and '60s and '70s before it was defined was it was that was genius. Um, if, if you're doing it, if you discover this and have the confidence to uh, to do something before you know when the academics are saying that it's it's hogwash, then you get credit. But to just do it at this point when it, it's all it's you know you can just run it. You can, there's off-the-shelf software that'll do this for you now. You subscribe to a stock screener and just do it. Um, you don't really get credit for this. You don't get paid for it very much. But for, at the individual level, it's, it's, it's uh, useful to bring into it's your... It's great for the individual because it costs so little. These factor funds cost less than a percent, but they outperform the S&P by a few percent a year over the long run. That's fantastic. So it's, a, it's great for investors. So, so now how, does the, how would the investor put it all together, you, you, you'd say they should have a, uh, you know, a, a diversify with the factors or say, I, you know, I happen to like momentum more than the other factors for a whole host of reasons. So do I, do I say, uh, you know, I'm going to do momentum f investing or? So to bring it back to the individual uh, portfolio level, first of all, you got to define your asset allocations. We talked about diversification in an earlier episode. I mean, diversification is the only free lunch in investing, right? So you decide based on your age, based on your risk tolerance, perhaps you take a look at the valuation of the stock market in your home country or the countries you're considering investing in. Oh, that, that's one thing, not to, not to interrupt you, but that's one thing we should specify with these factors. I mean, they've been robustly tested. They, they work in all the markets around the world, they've, they've shown to have Absolutely. this. Absolutely. They work better overseas now than in the U.S. because the U.S. is such a competitive investing environment. So, so, um, so I mean, they, not to harp on it, but there's a, there's a lot of, uh, to, to, so, we, and so we can advance the discussion. There's, there's, a, there's been a lot of rigorous testing of, of these, of these uh, factors to show that it works throughout time. That's right. To get the official factor stamp from the academics, something has to be pervasive across different markets all around the world and long-standing. So did it, did it work you know, in Sweden from the 1920s through the present? How about Japan? You know, all around the world and for a long time. So these, these have been proven with a very high degree of statistical significance. Okay, so now, so now, so now sorry, now getting back to putting it together and, and how to implement it, you were saying? I was saying, so these factors, everybody's focused on equities, everybody's favorite asset class, because equities over the long run will give you the highest return, and within a diversified portfolio, the majority of your, of your um, returns over time will come from equities, but the diversification um, smooths out those returns. That's something we can come back to in another episode. but. Um, the factors help you within the equity asset class, within your equity allocation. Say you're going to do you know, half treasury bonds, half equities. Well, within that equity portion, don't just do the S&P 500. You can do better. It's, don't try to pick stocks. Number one, and to get back to, to, get back to that, um, factors, factor investing is not considered stock picking anymore, but that's what it is. It's basically just defined, it's stock picking according to defined formulas. And it's really the only kind worth trying because there's nobody beating the market consistently who, who's not using factors. Even Buffett is just using factors. It's been proven in a paper recently, Buffett's alpha. 
that what Buffett has been doing for his whole career, even before this stuff was developed, can be explained by a few simple rules. So you can be Buffett by just, by just running stock screens. So don't try to do anything else. It's all, it's all very well understood. Um, you just just buy buy factor funds. Yeah, diver, diversify your factors. Value and quality. I would do I would do value and quality together. They work well together. And small cap and maybe small cap value and quality because value and quality work better better at the small cap level because the big there's a it's harder for big money to get in there. And I would diversify internationally too. But that goes back to again back to diversifying. Um, and I do momentum. Momentum is a nice complement. It's very different. Um, it's going to be in very different stocks than a value and quality fund. It's going to be in your your high flyers, which are probably overvalued. Um, although there are funds now that marry that marry momentum and quality, momentum and value. They look for cheap stocks that are in an uptrend. That works. Um, so yeah, they divide it up into a, into a basket into baskets. But that's just within your equity within your equity allocation. And there's something to be said for diversifying the factors because they don't all work all the time. That's right. To get back to the point that there's no free lunch, um, you're paid extra for being in these factor funds because they, they can and will lag the S&P for a long time. I mean, value can lag the S&P for years. In the late 90s, value was just, I mean, People, people were saying it, it didn't work anymore, that Buffett had lost his touch. But uh, then value, barely, value stocks barely fell in the bear market that came after when the NASDAQ fell 85%. So in the long run, you're compensated for, for being in factor funds. But the price you pay, there's always a price. If you're getting an excess return over a bank account, over treasury bills, you're always paying a price. Just by being in the stock market, you're paying the price of volatility. Uh, the possibility that stocks are going to go down over half and stay down for many years, that happens. Um, but on top of that general market risk, you may underperform the market on top. You may, you may fall more. You may stay steady when the S&P is going up. You're, uh, and people get frustrated by that. They bail out. So it's, uh, there's always some, some emotional or behavioral reason why this excess return can be had in the long run. And it's always in the long run. Don't, the, one way you can go really wrong here, and a lot of people do, is to switch around based on recent performance. There's such bias towards recent performance. The, the industry encourages this. You know Morningstar's ranking system? They, they rank their mutual funds, they give them the stars based on recent performance. It's like three, over the last three years, performance is mean reverting, both for active managers and for, and for these passive um, factor funds. You should actually be in the guy who's underperformed for the last three years because odds are, this is proven, odds are if he's underperformed for the last three years, unless he's like, a complete idiot. If he's a, this is like a professionally professionally managed fund with a lot of assets. Um, he's going to outperform over the next three years. So don't switch back and forth. Don't switch around these factors. You just want to set it and forget it. I think that's an important point. Um, just spend a little bit of time on that. But the idea, I think, to, to get comfortable is to really understand where this extra return comes from. The comes from the factors and then you have to stick with it. You gotta stick with it. Yeah. And the only way to stick with it is to know it ahead of time and to really buy into it. Because when it doesn't work for you, you're gonna feel the, the pressure to make changes. That's right. Which is one of the reasons on a side note why I like um, momentum in a strategy because that it deals with that, it deals with the, it, it, it makes you feel that you're responding to the, um, to the changing market, mm -hmm. and but the downside of it, the downside of momentum is that when 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 uh, is that everybody's hurt is hurting, and that's what's driving it. And when that when that when the herd decides to switch, it, it turns on you. Um, but that that aside, the, the the idea that you know sometimes momentum works, sometimes uh, size works, sometimes uh, 
uh, value works, but they all work at they can all work at different times, and 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 putting it together, it's almost it's no different than having a diversified asset asset classes. You're diversifying with with factors, and cumulatively, at the end of a meaningful investment period, to say 10, 10, 15 years, you have a you're going to have excess return. You're going to have less volatility than you would have up, have otherwise. I wouldn't necessarily count on less volatility. By using factor funds, right? Good point. Right. In, in that's a good point. The, but you'll you'll have excess. You'll, return. you'll have the excess return to dampen the volatility. You have to do the asset that's class. Right, value, value funds, value stocks are more volatile than. And that might be the price you pay for the excess return. That's right. That's it would right. be argued. Mm -hmm. I want to spend a little bit time on the size thing because for a lot of people, that's uh, intuitive. It's intuitive that large companies don't go to the, go to the sky, and small companies can gr can grow, uh, can have more space to grow. But there was a uh, a quote I came across a long time back by Munger, and, and I thought it was it was great. He goes, "Most large companies become mediocre, and most small companies stay small." And I think that's from whatever I've seen. That's true. And the stock pickers game is to identify the small companies that transcend their smallness and can grow on that on that hockey shaped curve. I don't think anybody has been able to I, I don't know of any manager who's who's really who's been able to do that for their whole career. You look at Peter Lynch, Bill Miller, other great names like that. These guys had good runs, 10 years, 15 years, and then they just did they lose the touch or were they lucky? Because they came to an end, an abrupt end, and then vastly underperformed. So, so that, so that's one thing. Is that is that um, is it really doable to identify those those small companies that are going to go through that hockey stick curve or the S curve, whatever it's called in business school? Um, and then the and and then the other the other aspect of it is that. Uh, uh, so, oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought here. Um, Oh, what I was going to say is this: is that you know. So what's interesting in doing it within the space of the S and P five hundred? What's interesting maybe is that they've gotten through a th certain threshold, like they're above just the small cap drudgery. Stocks do drop out of the S and P, though. But at the and at the end of it all, um, whether you know whether we say the, the the numbers have shown that it works, meaning whether we whether it's. Whether you know, I have this. I had this saying, which I came across a saying by Munger, which I thought was interesting. Um, but at the end of the day, small cap has shown to work. Sure, you're not writing down the the majority of stocks that have traded in the U.S. markets have gone to zero. Right. But you're not writing them all the way down to zero. You do have some risk management built into this. Like you'll define small cap. I don't know, as a uh, half a billion dollars to three billion dollars, something like that. And when a stock falls beneath half a billion, you sell it. You're not in it. You're not riding it to zero. So you do have some risk control built in there. And that and that's these are done by the the people that are managing this. this yeah, I mean, these these factors aren't strictly defined, but um, everybody's got their own formula, and that accounts for risk management. But um, let's let's talk about what's what's missing from this whole discussion of factors. So. To get back to the concept of beating the markets, factors are one easy, accessible, inexpensive way of beating the S&P 500 over the long term. But when it comes to your real world experience of having a, an investment portfolio, that's not the most meaningful metric. The S&P 500 is kind of an arbitrary index. You should measure yourself not against the S&P, but against your own goals for your portfolio. You know, are you saving to, to buy a house for, in 10 years, to put your kids through college in 15 years, to retire in 30 years? And you should, you should measure your per performance against that goal. And you should have some idea of an acceptable range of volatility. Um, can you accept a 50% drawdown, a 60% drawdown? 
or, or would you, or will you accept a lower? You, you could just save less. I mean, save save more and accept a a, a, well, that, a smaller compound rate of return with a lower drawdown. So you don't want to you don't want to ever lose half your money, but you want to have you know X percent when you're 60 years old. Well, why don't you just save you know 20 percent of your income instead of 10 percent and invest in a way that you know, you only need to get a four percent real return to get there. Well, you can do that with without ever losing more than ten percent of your money, seven percent of your money. I mean, that's that's a good point. I mean, the the, the client would be like, Rick, you're the, you're the money manager. Stop putting the burden on me. You, you, you do your job. But but it's a good point because the point is that if you can identify what your real goals are and what yeah. the rate of return you need to achieve that, then you can substantially take less risk. That's right. And this this is the avenue that this is this is outside of something. Academics haven't really discussed this whole aspect of portfolio design at the asset class level, or at the um, at the level of risk adjusted returns. We've already talked about the two ways of improving your risk adjusted returns: uh, portfolio design by asset allocation, how much in stocks, how much in foreign stocks, treasury bonds, foreign bonds, real estate, commodities. Just just putting together a robust asset allocate global asset allocation portfolio like that will give you a return that has it may outperform stocks over many 10 even 20 year periods. If stocks are going through a rough patch, you'll outperform them. And with a lot less downside, a lot less volatility. So that's beating the markets. The other way is to take into account valuation. This is something that only a few academics like to talk about. I mean, Robert Schiller won a Nobel Prize for this kind of work. Um, you can adjust your exposure to the stock market based on its valuation. Yeah, that's market timing. Oh, scary. <laughs> well, market timing. The scary bit of market timing is when you're looking at charts and you're looking at the wiggles and saying, oh, I'm going to buy this dip and sell this rally or um, just going about it through you know, gut feelings and chart reading or, or trying to pick stocks based on their patterns or what you think the Fed's going to do or the election or whatever. That, don't even try that. That's, that's not how it works. Um, that's not a game you can win. But the market timing that you can consistently win at that can really improve your experience and your long-term risk-adjusted returns and even your long-term uh, nominal returns, headline overall returns, is by scaling in and out of a market. As it gets expensive, you scale out. As it gets cheaper, you scale back in. By some formula or? Yeah, make a, make a simple formula and use, and use a historically reliable fundamental metric, um, a, a price multiple. Look at the the price to sales ratio, price to book ratio, market cap of all U.S. stocks to U.S. GDP, um, the Schiller P/E ratio, smooth average of of, uh, of earnings. Uh, you can there are, there are different formulas you can use here. They're all going to tell you roughly the same thing at any given point in time, and you just scale in and out. You say, all right, when the markets at its historical median valuation, I'm going to be 100% in stocks or 50% in stocks. And if it gets cheaper than that, I'll be 100% in. And when it gets to this, this level, a more expensive level like where we are now, I'm going to be either out of stocks or I'm going to have less in stocks and more in bonds. And you do that, you do that slow and steady. You do that, say, once a year, once a quarter. Once a year is enough. This is real slow. This is a real slow process. And you just do what the formula says. You don't guess. You don't say, oh, well, interest rates are low, so I'm going to stay in stocks even though they're expensive according to this metric. No, you just, you just do what the formula says. And over the long term, you're going to have a much better risk-adjusted return than if you were just in, mar in stocks all the time. And this, this is an avenue, this is a, an area that in my opinion, is the last, it's like the last refuge of alpha. Now Schiller's done great work here, and some practitioners have done, money managers have done some great work here. 
um, but it's largely ignored by most most investors and by uh, most academics. People are just so focused on the S and P. How do you beat the S and P? That's their only yardstick. You know, if the S and P is down fifty percent and they're down forty percent, that's good enough. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> No, what matters is how your portfolio does over time. How do you design a good portfolio? How do you have a better experience between now and uh, buying a house in retirement? And so you really should take a look at valuation before you decide. You look, you look at valuation to decide how much to put in the stock market. And then within that stock allocation, you you look at what factors you want to use and how to outperform the S&P. But you don't always want to be in stocks at the same amount. You should vary that exposure, especially at extremes. The market, when the market's really cheap, you want to make sure you have stocks. When the market's really expensive, you want to think long and hard about whether you can withstand many years of, of poor returns and major losses. So to do that, uh, requires, like you said, there's, I don't know if this accounts in the realm of a free, no free lunch, but to, to do something like that may require you sitting out of the market for that, that's, a that's, long period of time. That's why it's paid. That's why you get paid so well. That's why there's such a big reward in, um, if not in absolute returns, and I believe there is a reward here in absolute returns, even over the long run, but certainly over a shorter run. And I, I, there's unquestionably a big reward in risk-adjusted returns, meaning perhaps you give up a percent over just holding the S&P for 50 years by doing this, but if instead of losing half your money or more than half your money, um, you know, four or five times over that 50-year period, you only lose, you know, 15, 20 percent or whatever, um, and recover, you know, in real terms, the stock market has, so talk about market, let's back up and talk about market history since we're talking about long-term valuation-based market timing. 1901, you had, you had the market reach a real high valuation. It went nowhere between then and 1921. In fact, it went down by quite a bit, like 75% when adjusted for inflation. Then you had the roaring bull market of the 1920s. And then from 1929 to early in the 1950s, it went nowhere. That was over, over 20 years, again, two 20 year periods there. Within the first half of the 20th century, the market went nowhere. And then from the, you know, in the 50s, early 60s, you had another roaring bull market. The, market, the Dow hit 1,000 in 1966. It was still 1,000 in 1982, but in the meantime, you'd had a lot of inflation adjusted for inflation, you lost 75%. Over 16 years, so that's another long period. Then again, we had the big bull market of the 80s and 90s. The market hit absurd valuations in 99, 2000. And you look forward to 2012, 2013 it was. You had to wait that long for the market to get back to where it had been in 1999. So, you know, on a side note, what's amazing about that market time between 1999 and 2012-13 is the market really went nowhere with a lot of volatility, yet it wasn't the death of equity culture. No. <laughs> yeah, on a historical we're... basis, the valuations still were as frothy as they've ever been. Yeah, the, the, the biggest draw, I mean, you could, you could look at 2000 to 2009 as like one big bear market because it didn't rally back all that much in real terms from 2003 to 2007. It was a short little little bull market. Um, but yeah, when it after after it came back up to the old highs and made new highs, you know, down 10,000 again and then on on up, people just piled back into it and now they've driven it to obscene valuations again. So, so you know, so that, that's where we are now, where we're in a market which on a historical basis is as expensive as it's ever been, uh, comparable to 20, 1929 or, or 2000. So I want to take, take, discuss this from a few angles. One is the, one is, uh, the idea of long-term long -term, uh, uh, exposure to equities being a source of, of alpha. Um, 
And so Buffett, we know, has come out in recent years saying, uh, saying that it's hard to time the markets and advocating just simple S&P indexing. Um, but at the same time, you, you have to, there's a difference between what he's saying and what he's doing. I mean, Buffett, he's letting his cash balance pile up. He times the markets. The guy sits on massive amounts of cash and doesn't deploy it until valuations come down. Um, yeah, he, he sat out the dot-com boom, let his cash build up, deployed it when things got cheap. Um, again, he let some cash build up, and then he, he went all in. He had tons of cash to, you know, he did that preferred stock deal with Goldman Sachs. And Bank of America. Bank of America. Just, he bought a lot, he bought a whole lot in that crash because he had the cash. And now again, he's letting cash. And pile he's letting up. letting cash pile up. So there, there's you have to account for. Uh, so the idea is that I don't. I mean, somebody like him, I think he does everything consciously. But the idea of of um, that long term equity forecasting is the last refuge of alpha. You call it? Yeah, I wouldn't call it forecasting. I would just call it being frugal, just buying right, and being having the patience to sit on the sidelines and sit out that last bit of a bull market. And that last bit can be, it can be two, three, even four years where you're just, you're just letting some cash sit there and maybe taking more off the table as it goes higher because you'll get paid for that. It's frustrating, yeah, it's frustrating because the higher the market goes, the more people are gonna get in it and the more people you know are gonna start talking about it. I mean, just in the last few months, I, I've heard <laughs> A lot of people talk about the stock market who have no idea what they're doing and they're waiting in and buying individual stocks. And yeah, they're making money on some of them, but it's, it's uh, you know. This would, be, this would be something for a future session. I do want to, want to talk to you about uh, this idea. Is, are people still stock picking and, and you're saying they're buying they individual are, stocks? Yeah, but I think <laughs> you've had more and more of the smart money realize that that uh, indexing, the passive investing is the way to go. Very few, very few individuals know about um, factor investing, um, but more and more people know about index funds. So passive investing would mean f factors are like, they're passive active, formulaic active. They're really passive though. You're just doing what the formula says. It's just a different formula than S&P. It's the value formula, the momentum formula. Um, but yeah, more and more individual investors are piling into this market now, and they have no idea what they're doing. And so when you're sitting out the end of a bull market, you're surrounded by idiots who are making money. And that hurts. It's frustrating. You're doubting yourself. I'll tell you one thing. That's, they, they say it's really tough, and, and, and that's one of the th that's one of the prices I'm always willing to pay because I've seen when it turns on you how you can lose more money in weeks than it takes a lifetime to accumulate. It happens fast. So it feels like it's a long time, but the alternative of losing, like we saw in the financial crisis, losing 50, 60, 70 percent of capital in the course of a few months is 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 far worse. <laughs> Yeah, and this is so easy to do. This is the only, this is like, this is the last refuge of alpha. I don't know if you call it alpha or what, but I, I think you call it alpha because it, it, takes, it takes guts, it takes being different, um, it takes standing apart from the crowd. The problem is that it gets called market timing and market timing has a bad name in, in, uh, contem in, contemporary, in the contemporary world. Sure. And uh, and there's all you know. There's the joke that I've called eighteen of the last three recessions. <laughs> so the, 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 there's all this cumulatively w between all the perma bears and people calling tops and and uh, and everything's a bubble and and somehow the world's moving along fine and seems like everyone's ha everyone's happy <laughs> that that uh, it's the it's the what's what's the the, the sky is fall. The, all the people that cry, call the sky is falling never materialize. So, so it's um, 
it's it's I don't know. If, that's my interpretation yeah. why it's gotten. I mean, I I don't see the sky is falling. I did I did back in 07, but the sky really was about to fall then. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is just this is just an expensive market. Yeah, there'll be a bear market. There'll be a recession. Just I would just say, do it formulaically. You don't have to have any opinion about what's going to happen. All you have to do is say, I don't like these prices. I'm just gonna sit on some cash for a while, see what happens, wait for opportunities. That's all. Um, this segues into a whole other topic, which which we probably could save for a future episode. Do you think we have anything else left that we want to talk about today for, for factoring? I think factoring that sums it up. Just uh, the S and P is not the only game in town. You can beat it. It doesn't cost you much. Um, yeah, look into look into factor funds for your for your equity portion. It's a it's an easy way to to beat the market. And on a, on a, on a Closing note: I saw some interesting stuff. Some like the Godfather of of uh, of passive investing, Burton Malkiel. He's now on the board of one of these robo advisors. And come out that hey, maybe it's possible to beat the market. I mean, there's just too there's just too much evidence out there that supports that there are market beating activities. It's just that the cost of, of achieving those things have been have come down. Sure. It's, yeah. It's a, it's a great time to be an investor it's a great it, it really is a great time to be an investor that's a good that's a good way to to close this episode thanks for watching see you next time and don't forget to like and subscribe <laughs>